Hello and welcome to this lecture on ability test for employee selection. Ability tests have been used in selection for over a hundred years. These tests are both efficient and effective in helping organizations make selection decisions. Let's get started. Ability tests are standardized measure of some knowledge, skill, ability, or other characteristic. Existing tests have been developed to assess abilities of job applicants that include physical, mental, mechanical, and clerical ability, amongst others. This knowledge results from formal learning experiences. Generally, these tests are paper and pencil in nature and were developed to be administered to several applicants at the same time. The obvious exception to this paper and pencil format is physical abilities testing, which typically requires special equipment to assess abilities such as muscular strength, cardiovascular endurance, and movement coordination. There are two traditional forms of ability test. The first is the aptitude test, which is said to measure knowledge acquired without formal training. Aptitude tests were thought to measure innate levels of underlying KSAOs, or in other words, some type of so-called natural ability. Alternatively, they had been thought to represent the potential future use of innate abilities. The second is the achievement test, which measures current levels of knowledge acquired through formal learning or educational experiences. In reality, the distinction between the two forms of ability test is arbitrary. All ability tests measure what a person has learned up to the time he or she takes the test. It is not possible to test raw potential here. It is only possible to ask test respondents to respond about information or experiences they already know. For this reason, the terms aptitude and achievement have been replaced by the term ability. Let's move on. Mental ability tests can be better understood by discussing three basic points. The first point pertains to the relationship between the content of early mental ability tests and academic achievement. In the past, these tests have been validated by correlating test scores with educational achievement used as the criterion. It was assumed that educational attainment or achievement should be related to mental ability because people with higher mental ability should be able to be more successful in school. In other words, they have greater ability to learn in formal education and training situations. Second, ability tests actually measure different underlying abilities. Mental ability tests can measure several distinct abilities. Mental abilities include general reasoning, logical evaluation, spatial orientation, numerical fluency, verbal comprehension, amongst many others. Of course, what is measured by the test is related to the content of that test. A particular test may not measure all mental abilities. In other words, these tests are not interchangeable because they do not have identical content. Third, a variety of scores can be obtained from these tests. A general mental ability test will measure several various mental abilities and provide an overall score purported to represent overall general mental ability. Or a test may be designed to provide separate scores on each ability, which are then summed to report a total score. Or a test may measure separate abilities and only report separate scores for the measured abilities instead of providing an overall score for general mental ability. Let's move on. The Wunderlich personnel test is one of the most commonly used general mental ability tests in the employment setting. It is inexpensive and quick to administer. The Wunderlich was developed in 1938. It consists of 50 multiple choice items. It is a 12 minute timed test with the resulting score of the number of correct answers out of 50 that you give in 12 minutes. There are two forms. The forms have shown substantially high 
parallel forms equivalency reliability. The content of the test covers vocabulary, common sense reasoning, arithmetic reasoning and computation, analogies, perceptual skills, spatial relations, number series, scrambled sentences, syllogisms, and knowledge of proverbs. Obviously, the Wonderlick assesses a wide range of general mental abilities. Okay, so you might be wondering what a syllogism is. It means a logical argument involving three propositions, or in other words, using deductive reasoning. You should start using this, the word syllogism in everyday conversation. It will impress your friends or confuse them. Either way, it's a cool word. The Wonderlick primarily measures verbal comprehension, followed by deduction and then numerical fluency. The Wonderlick has a long history of use, which means that the test has an extensive set of reliability estimates, validity estimates, and norm scores developed. This extensive data supports the Wonderlick as a high quality selection tool, which is great because the way that you should choose a selection tool is by the data available to support its quality. You can trust the Wonderlick. Let's move on. This slide shows a few examples of items that are similar to those that are found on the Wonderlick personnel test. The Wonderlick test is copyrighted and I can't show you those items here. As you can see, the items assess areas of common sense knowledge, such as knowing the number of days in each month of the year as shown in number one. Items two, four, and six assess vocabulary. Item three assesses the ability to recognize a number series. Item five assesses simple arithmetic. And each of these areas is associated with general mental ability. Let's take a closer look at a couple of them. Look at item one, which of the following months has 30 days? Technically, this item should say which of the following months has exactly 30 days because August and December also have 30 days plus an extra, making it 31. Let's look at number six. The two words relevant and immaterial mean, and the correct answer is the opposite. You can see that these questions can be answered rather quickly and all 50 can be answered in 12 minutes. Let's move on. Mental ability tests have enjoyed widespread use over the past 100 years, in particular because of the extensive use by the U.S. Army and other military organizations. The U.S. military and Israeli military, for example, have a long record of the use of cognitive ability tests that help them place individuals in the most appropriate entry-level military positions. Because of this widespread use, researchers have conducted numerous studies of the validity associated with mental ability tests. One of these validity studies was called Project A. Project A was a multi-year effort to develop a selection system appropriate for all entry-level positions in the U.S. Army. It involved the development of 65 predictor tests that could be used as selection instruments. The project produced results indicating that general mental ability tests are valid selection instruments across a large variety of military jobs. Some of the findings of this project are reflected in the table. Project A found very strong relationships between scores on both general mental ability tests and tests of the specific mental abilities of spatial ability and perceptual psychomotor ability with both job performance criteria of core technical proficiency and general soldiering proficiency. Mental ability showed much higher validity coefficients than those of factors such as personality, vocational interest, or job reward preference. Again, a validity coefficient is a correlation, and in this case, it's a correlation between the score on these tests and the later score on performance, and in this case, it's soldier's performance. Let's move on. So another way to assess the usefulness of cognitive ability tests has to do with the notion of validity generalization. 
A test that is generalizable may be used across many different job settings and many different organizations with similar usefulness. In contrast, a test that is situationally specific can only be used for a specific job or set of jobs or within a specific organization. So for many years, the research showed that validity coefficients for mental ability tests differed greatly across different organizations. In other words, evidence showed a lack of generalizability. However, as time went on, these differences were thought to be caused by undetermined organizational factors that affected the correlation between selection instrument scores and job performance scores. Selection specialists concluded at that time that a validation study is necessary for each selection program developed by each company. However, more recent work involving meta-analysis of differences and issues associated with validity test results indicates otherwise. Remember that a meta-analysis corrects for stati statistical artifacts that are unique to each research sample and situation. These meta-analyses conclude that there are no organizational effects on validity. Therefore, tests of general mental ability can be used across all organizations. It is no longer necessary to conduct validity studies within each organization. Additionally, it is necessary only to demonstrate through job analysis that the job is similar to the job in the validity generalization study. In other words, it's appropriate to use existing validation data from jobs similar to those ones being selected for or to justify the use of the mental ability test in selection. GMA tests are also valid across a wide variety of jobs. Now, isn't this interesting? Not only is situational specificity within organizations false, but situational specificity within jobs is also false. In other words, general mental ability is extremely useful in assessing job candidates across a wide range of organizations and across a wide range of jobs. Let's move on. One very widely cited meta-analysis of mental ability tests and, and other selection tests was conducted by Frank Schmidt and John Hunter in their 1998 article in Psychological Bulletin. This was a very interesting and important article. Basically, what Schmidt and Hunter found was that GMA is indeed one of the best all-around selection tools that we can use in our hiring practices. Their findings showed that only one other selection tool had a better validity coefficient than general mental ability, and that tool was the work sample test. Well, it should make sense, as it is always wonderful to be able to actually assess a job candidate's ability to do a job by, well, taking a sample of that job candidate's ability to actually do the job. But other than that, the general mental ability test is the best single way to predict job success if no other selection tools are used to predict success. The interesting twist from Schmidt and Hunter is that they examine the usefulness of using GMA as a selection tool and address the incremental usefulness of adding one additional selection method to the GMA test. Take a look at the findings in this table. The best combination of selection tools is to use a GMA test with either a work sample or an integrity test. However, again, the work sample test is only appropriate for jobs that require very specific experience. For jobs that have no such requirements, the combination of GMA and integrity test scores is the strongest combination predictor of job success. The moral of this story is that the use of several selection tests can add incremental validity to the hiring process. That is, if you use a good combination of tools. You should keep this in mind when we discuss the other types of selection tools. Let's move on. An important question to ask is whether mental ability tests are related at all to illegal discrimination. Although cognitive ability tests are among the most valid of selection tools, they have the possibility of creating adverse impact against minorities. 
one component of this concept is the concept of differential validity. This relates to the hypothesis that employment tests are less valid for minority group members than for non-minority group members. This relates to the concept of test bias, or the idea that tests are more appropriate for one group over another group based on the way that they were developed or written. So the question is, are validities for the same selection test for two different groups both statistically significant? But are they unequal in their level of validity due to cultural bias and the content of the ability test? What this is asking is, okay, so a test is valid for more than one group of job applicants based upon some protected characteristic, but is the level of the validity different for a protected subgroup within that group? Consistent research has shown that regarding mental ability testing is that differential validity does not exist. Research shows that validity coefficients in most research are not different on the basis of minority status. Scores on general mental ability tests are able to order or rank job applicants within their respective protected categories on about the same level of accuracy regardless of protected class status. Let's move on. It is good news that there is no differential validity demonstrated between protected groups. That being said, it has been established that mental ability tests do have adverse impact against minorities. Meta-analysis of differences among different uh, demographic groups in scores on cognitive ability tests has shown consistent and significant differences in mean test scores amongst racial and ethnic groups. This can be assessed by use of the D statistic, which is the difference in means divided by the sample weighted average of the standard deviations. This is a way of determining differences amongst groups in a function of differences within groups. Think about it for a moment. If there are large differences within a subgroup, that's good. This makes it less significant if there are differences between the groups. In other words, the fact that differences exist within subgroups suggests that it is the underlying construct being measured that is causing the differences, rather than the test itself being biased against one or more protected groups simply by the way it is written. A meta-analysis by Roth and his colleagues found that there is indeed a significant adverse impact on minorities from the use of general mental ability tests. This is a serious dilemma. Cognitive ability tests are the, among the most valid indicators of job success, and yet they do indeed have adverse impact against minorities. Of course, the cause behind this is beyond the scope of a human resource management course. It is likely that differences in our education system, along with differences in socioeconomic status, relate to scores attained by various minority groups on cognitive ability tests. So what do we do? Well, we have a couple of guidelines. First, it is obvious that you must demonstrate validity or job relatedness of the use of the cognitive ability test in a selection program explicitly because adverse impact is a common occurrence. Second, it is important to combine the results of cognitive ability testing with other selection data in order to make a well-informed hiring decision and to lessen adverse impact in this regard. Let's move on. So far, I've emphasized general mental ability in this lecture. However, some jobs require additional abilities that are job-related and necessary to assess. One area is that of mechanical ability. Any job that has a requirement of mechanical knowledge obviously requires assessment of job applicants' background in that area. Mechanical ability refers to characteristics that tend to make for success in work with machines and equipment. Testing methods include manual performance in terms of assembly manipulation, as well as written problems to assess knowledge of mechanical ability. Abilities measured include areas such as spatial visualization, 
perceptual speed and accuracy, and mechanical information. An example of a widely used mechanical ability test is the Bennett Mechanical Comprehension Test. It is used for industrial jobs to measure the ability to perceive and understand physical forces and mechanical elements in practical situations. It uses pictures of familiar objects and scenes to ask questions requiring logical analysis. The Bennett test is best used for assessing applicants for positions that require a grasp of the principles underlying the operation and the repair of complex devices. It is intended to measure an individual's aptitude for learning mechanical skills. Let's move on. Another area that is potentially job related and important to assess is that of physical abilities. Many jobs have a physical component to them. There are several reasons for physical ability testing. First, there are more female applicants for male dominated jobs than ever before. For business necessity reasons, it is important to assess whether job applicants have the required physical abilities to be able to do a job effectively. Second, Physical ability tests reduce the incidence of work-related injuries. It's important to hire individuals who are physically able to do a job to avoid costs associated with workplace injury, workers' compensation, and lost time. Third, physical ability tests are useful to determine the physical status of job applicants. The key is determined to determine who is fit for duty and who is not. We want well-qualified individuals on the job. Of course, there are some legal issues in testing physical abilities. Adverse impact for scores on physical ability tests does, does indeed exist. For example, a heavy lifting requirement will always negatively impact females in relation to males for jobs in general. Therefore, a couple of issues must be addressed. First, tests must be clearly linked to critical job tasks that require physical abilities in their completion. Related to this, the question is whether the task can be modified to reduce or eliminate these physical demands, that is, providing a reasonable accommodation for disabled applicants. The challenge is to assess job relatedness when requiring particular physical abilities of potential job hires. Keep in mind that numerous physical abilities may be required for particular jobs. A physical abilities job analysis will tell you whether the job has any of these requirements that should be assessed. Requirements such as static strength, dynamic strength, explosive strength, trunk strength, flexibility, gross body coordination, stamina, etc. Let's move on. I have discussed ability tests in this lecture, including tests of general mental ability, mechanical ability, and physical ability. When considering any test, the main idea is to assess the quality of the selection tool in terms of its contribution to the hiring process. This includes assessing various aspects of the selection tool. First, you should assess the reliability of the tool. Does the selection tool yield consistent results across test administrations each time you give the test to individual respondents. It is impossible to put faith in a selection tool that gives inconsistent scores to individuals because one cannot assess the individual's true underlying score on that particular construct. So it is important to examine reliability information on an established test to make sure that it yields reliable results. Second, it is important to assess the validity information related to an existing test. You should ask the question whether test scores have been determined to be related to real on-the-job performance of individuals who have taken the test. Job relatedness is key here. This is what will help you defend your organization against the charge of illegal discrimination. Third is this aspect of legality. Make sure that the use of a chosen ability test can be defended in a court of law. You should be able to explain how the ability test is job related and whether it has adverse impact and whether it is defensible. Last, 
It's important for a test to have positive utility in the selection process. That is, the ability test should add significant additional predictive value in the selection contest. A selection tool has utility if it earns its keep, so to speak. A selection tool will provide additional utility if it helps an organization make a better hiring decision above and beyond the cost of using that selection tool in the hiring process. In other words, we can only spend so much money on the selection process. We should only use those selection tools that provide more benefit than they cost. Ability tests seem to fit that bill quite nicely. The good news is that reputable test developer companies provide much of these tests and information in their test manuals. Be wary of using a test being marketed by a testing company if they cannot provide adequate data and evidence supporting the test quality in these areas. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all, folks.